In the last lecture, we talked about the structure of the brain, the geography of the brain. But I want to get now into sort of the nitty gritty of what the brain does and where the functions are localized. And to do that, we're going to have to jump forward in time. We're going to have to start using more advanced technology. So we're going to talk about functional neuroimaging. Imaging brain function in real time. So we're not just talking about the physical structure of the brain anymore. Now we're going to talk about what the brain does and how it does it. And it's going to require some pretty interesting and advanced technology to look inside the brain and see what it is doing in real time. There are many types of neuroimaging and there are new technologies being developed all the time, which is really fascinating. There are a lot of ways to look inside the brain and see what's happening. We can use positron emission tomography, PET, injecting a radioactive tracer into the blood that's visible once it gets into the brain. We can use fMRI, using very powerful magnetic fields to see where the blood is flowing in the brain. Or we can use FNIRs to look at blood flow using infrared light actually passed directly through the head. Or we can use TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, using a very powerful highly localized magnet to either selectively activate or inhibit brain regions. There are other measures. There are electrophysiological measures like EEG, electroencephalography. I'm actually wearing my EEG shirt with its brain waves. Got to wrap the EEG. Uh, related, we have MEG, which measures instead of electricity, is measuring magnetic fields generated by the brain. These neuroimaging techniques can be split into two major categories. Some of them measure electricity. They're measuring brain activity in a very direct way. So things like EEG or MEG or electrocorticography where we either measure magnetic fields or the electrical activity using electrodes, that's measuring brain activity in a very direct way. It's measuring the electrical signals that the neurons are sending to each other. Every time your neurons fire, they send an electrical impulse to all of their connected neurons. And we can use electrodes to measure that electrical activity. So that's what's happening with these electrophysiological measures like EEG and MEG. They're very directly measuring brain activity. The other group of neuroimaging techniques measure blood. This might sound a little bit gross, but blood is the energy that we use to power brain activity. So these measures like PET and fMRI and FNIRs, they're not measuring brain activity directly, not the way that electrophysiology does. They're measuring it a little bit indirectly. They're measuring the blood that is sent after those neurons fire. Remember that our neuronal activity consists of neurons firing, sending an electrical signal to other neurons, and that creates a metabolic demand for glucose and oxygen. And the way that our body solves this problem is by sending blood flow to that region after the neurons fire. Blood is the thing that carries the glucose and carries the oxygen to replenish the energy for those neurons that have already acted. So we're measuring brain activity in a less direct way. We're measuring the energy that was required for the neurons to fire. So electrophysiology, EEG and MEG, measure the work as it is being done. And hemodynamics, PET, fMRI, and FNIRs, measure the energy needed to do the work. It's a little bit different ways of measuring essentially the same kind of thing. Both measuring brain activity, but measuring it in different ways. They're measuring different parts of the process. And these different techniques differ in terms of their invasiveness, their spatial resolution, how fine-grained they can be in terms of where these things are happening in the brain, and their temporal resolution, how fine-grained they can be in terms of when things are happening in the brain, and also their cost. Some of these are very expensive, some of them are much less expensive. So in general, the hemodynamic measures tend to be pretty good in terms of invasiveness. It doesn't require any kind of surgery, not like having electrodes implanted directly in your brain. FNIRs and fMRI are great in terms of their invasiveness. They're not invasive at all. And they have really good spatial resolution, or at least relatively good spatial resolution. It's not quite as good as implanting electrodes directly on the brain's surface, but it is a lot better 
than just measuring the electrical activity from the brain. So the spatial resolution for things like fMRI is pretty good. But it comes at a cost. The temporal resolution for fMRI is actually quite poor. Because we're measuring the blood flow and not the activity of the neurons themselves, we're just measuring what happens after the neurons fire, that means that there is a lag time, and that means that we can't get very good temporal resolution. We don't know exactly when things are happening in real time, but we know pretty well where they are happening. Now, fMRI and PET are also pretty expensive. They require huge machines with lots of maintenance, and fMRI in particular requires a superconducting magnet that has to be cooled with liquid helium and runs continuously. If it ever shuts down, it costs like thousands of dollars to start it back up again. It's an incredibly expensive machine. Whereas something like uh, EEG is extremely inexpensive, relatively inexpensive. It only costs like $20,000 instead of costing millions and millions of dollars. So there are lots of trade-offs here. But I think the more interesting point is that these different measures are actually good for answering different kinds of questions. What I want to focus on for this lecture are those brain measures that measure blood flow. In the old days, if you wanted to find out where something was happening in the brain, you had to use PET, positron emission tomography. PET is actually pretty cool. What you do with PET is you inject a radioactive tracer into the body. You embed it in like some glucose or water or something. I know it sounds bad, you're injecting radiation to a body, but it's harmless. So you inject someone with this radioactive material and then you put them into a scanner, and the scanner is what's imaging the electromagnetic radiation as that radioactive tracer decays. It undergoes radioactive decay. So that radioisotope emits a positron as it decays, and that positron collides with an electron. The two particles annihilate each other, and it produces two photons that travel in opposite directions. And that's the thing that the positron scanner is detecting. It's detecting those two photons shooting off in opposite directions of that positron and electron colliding with each other. So that's what's being measured and it's the quantity and the location of those that are being measured by the scanner. And that's what tells us where something is happening in the brain. It's basically a way of localizing the radioactive tracer in your blood supply. So the measure here is cerebral blood flow and the spatial resolution is pretty good. It's about four millimeters. But the temporal resolution is very, very bad. It's something like 30 to 40 seconds. So that's not very useful if we're looking at most of the things that human brains do. Most of the things human brains do take place on very short timescales. We operate very, very quickly. So it's not ideal. It's not ideal to inject radiation into a person. It's not ideal to have such a long temporal lag. We need better technology. Thankfully, we have better technology. We have fMRI. fMRI is a super cool, super advanced technology. Like I said, it has a super conducting magnet. The magnet that it contains is like thousands of times more powerful than the magnetic field of the Earth, which is just crazy. And it has to be cooled with liquid helium. So it's a very expensive machine, very expensive to maintain, very expensive to run. If you ever want to use an fMRI machine, like if you want to do an experiment, usually you have to rent out the lab time. You have to pay to use the machine. Um, but it makes sense because it is a very sophisticated piece of machinery. Well, how does fMRI actually work? Well, here's a fun fact. Human bodies are mostly water. And water is composed of hydrogen and oxygen, right? So we actually have an awful lot of hydrogen atoms in our bodies. And the nucleus of a hydrogen atom is a proton. So there are lots and lots of protons in a human body, basically. You're mostly protons, if we think about it. Okay, so what? Um, well, those protons normally are sort of just pointing in random directions. So, you know, subatomic particles have spin, they spin in a certain direction, and so they'll be pointing in a certain direction if you look at the direction of their spin. And the normal situation in our bodies is that all of these subatomic particles are just sort of spinning in random directions. So these protons are all pointing in random directions. But when they're exposed to a really, really powerful magnetic field, like the one generated by the MRI machine, then they align. They get pulled into alignment so that they're all pointing in the same direction. 
Once they're all pointing in the same direction, the MRI machine sends radio waves to disturb that equilibrium. It causes the protons to flip 90 degrees. Then when the radio wave stops, the protons will fall back into alignment because that magnetic field pulls them back into alignment. And as they do so, as they pull back into alignment, they produce their own radio signal. So these are the MRI decay rates that are measured by the MRI scanner. And the decay rates are different for different kinds of biological tissues based on how many protons they contain, how much hydrogen. Really, it's how much water they contain. So essentially what the MRI machine is measuring, it's measuring magnetic resonance. It's sort of like doing sonar. It's taking a reflection um, of that magnetic field. It's taking those radio waves emitted by those protons as they come into alignment, using that to reconstruct into a schematic that records the density of our tissues, it records how much water there is, which correlates with density. And so if you look at an, a scan from an MRI machine, it gives you a three-dimensional model of the density of all of the tissues in a human body. Pretty cool. Scanning a human body in this way is structural. That's structural MRI. It gives us a full three-dimensional view of all of the tissues in your entire body. Of course, that's not really what we're interested in if we're interested in cognitive neuroscience. We're interested in how brains work we're interested in processes being executed in human brains. So we don't just want to look at a brain and see its physical structures. We want to see what's actually happening. We want to do functional MRI. And with functional MRI, what we're going to be looking at is not just the structure of the physical brain itself, we're going to be looking at blood flow. So we're going to use that same technology. We're going to look at those decay rates, but we're going to apply that to blood because as it turns out, oxygenated blood has a different decay rate than deoxygenated blood. So the object that's being measured here, it's actually called the blood oxygenation level dependent signal, the bold signal. And the idea is that blood is more oxygenated in an activated region of the brain than in a non-activated region of the brain. Maybe another way of thinking about this is that as the neurons in your brain fire, they require energy. And the energy they get comes from your blood, comes from oxygenated blood. So if there are a lot of neurons firing in a specific region of your brain, there's going to wind up being more oxygenated blood flowing to that region of your brain to refuel those neurons. Okay, so then deoxygenated blood has a higher decay rate than oxygenated blood, and that means that we can tell the difference between blood that has oxygen and blood that doesn't. And the reason that's important is because Oxygenated blood is blood that has not yet reached the neurons that require it. Deoxygenated blood is blood that is leaving. It's already had its oxygen removed. So what we're looking for is oxygenated blood, the, the blood that is flowing into those areas where the neurons have just fired. And if we see that there's um, some areas where there's more of that signal, then we can hypothesize the reason for that is because the neurons in that region have been firing more than usual, at least more than the other neurons around it. So that's fMRI in a nutshell. This is nice because it doesn't require any radioactive tracers. It's not like PET. It has great spatial resolution, somewhere on the level of three millimeters. So it's pretty comparable to PET in that sense. And the temporal resolution is a lot better than PET. Here we're only dealing with a sort of hemodynamic lag of about three to six seconds. We don't have to wait for a radioisotope to decay in order to measure it. We just measure the blood flow directly. We're looking at oxygenation. So the lag is pretty short, but three to six seconds might still wind up being fairly considerable for most of our mental processes if we're interested in the time course of specific operations. But it is great if we're interested in asking questions about where certain processes are happening in the brain. As long as we don't subdivide too much to get into specific steps of an algorithm, if we're just interested in, well, where does something like facial recognition happen? fMRI is a really fantastic way of answering that kind of question. fMRI is generating a three-dimensional image of the blood flow in our brains. 
And so we measure it in voxels. A voxel is kind of like a pixel, except it's three-dimensional, where a pixel is two-dimensional. And for fMRI, we can parse brain activity sort of into these three millimeter cubes, three millimeter voxels. So we can sort of decompose the brain into these little bits. Those are the small atomic units of what's being measured. It's sort of like the pixels in an image. So when we look at an fMRI scan, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at these three dimensional voxels, which are about three millimeters on each edge. And, that'll, and then we can ask, is there blood flow in that region? How much blood flow is there in that three millimeter voxel? One important fact about both PET and fMRI is that you can't really just measure a brain and then know something about what's going on under the hood. You have to always have something to compare it to. So here's a fact about the brain. The brain is highly, highly active. You might have heard something about like, oh, you only use 10% of your brain. Um, and like the assumption is that maybe if you could use all of it, then you would unlock superpowers or something. I think there's a movie about this, what, Limitless, right? Don't try to limitless yourself. If you use 100% of your brain, you will have a horrific seizure and you might die. You don't want all of your neurons to be firing at the same time. That would be total chaos. But even so, a lot of our brain is active a lot of the time. So yeah, 100% of our brain isn't active all the time, and that's probably a good thing. We don't want all of our neurons to fire simultaneously. But a lot of our brain is firing at any given time. So when we look at just total brain activity, if we just measure that bold signal across an entire brain at any moment, you're gonna see activation everywhere. It's not gonna look like anything, it's just a bunch of noise. So if you're trying to answer a question like, where do we process faces in our brain? You can't just measure the brain while someone is looking at faces because all you're gonna see is a bunch of brain activity everywhere. It's not gonna tell us anything. We need a point of comparison. We need to compare it to what the brain activity looks like when we are not processing a human face. So these experiments have a very specific kind of structure. What we do is we compare the brain activity when someone is doing something like looking at a face or listening to a sentence or whatever. We compare that to some kind of baseline, usually when they're not doing anything. Maybe they're just looking at a fixation cross on a blank screen or something. And by subtracting that out, we can subtract out all of these kind of baseline processes and see what is the unique brain activity that is associated with just the one thing we care about, right? There's brain activity going on all the time, governing all kinds of bodily functions. You have to keep breathing. You have to keep your heart beating. You have to do lots of things in your brain at all times. So what we want to do is we want to find the unique contribution of a very specific brain process by subtracting out all of that other baseline stuff. So this subtraction method is actually extremely important. And whenever we talk about brain activity in fMRI studies, we always talk about elevation above baseline. And by the way, this is just a pro tip, don't use the expression lighting up, like say the brain lights up in some region or something, because the neuroscientists really hate it. I personally don't mind because that is what it looks like when you look at the pictures, right? It's like lighting up, but they really, really don't like it. So don't say it. All right, so what are we interested in here? We're interested in cognitive processes, right? We're interested in what the brain does. We're interested in like algorithmic terms. What kind of process or algorithm is the brain executing? Remember, the brain is the physical hardware, the implementation for our algorithms, for the software. We wanna know how those cognitive processes are being executed in the brain. So we're going to look at the brain activity to see how this works. But we want to be really clear about what this does and doesn't tell us. This tells us something very interesting about what kind of brain activity is happening that correlates with that cognitive process. fMRI research is fundamentally correlative. We are correlating brain activity with cognition. And you will often see it expressed that way in fMRI research. They will say, we are looking for the neural correlates of some kind of process. We're looking for the neural correlates of facial recognition. We're looking for the neural correlates of sentence processing. So what this doesn't tell us is it doesn't tell us whether these brain regions are necessary 
for that computation, whether they're necessary for that cognitive process. We may see some area activated above baseline in response to us looking at human faces, but we don't know if that area is required for us to see human faces, or if it's just an area that is useful for seeing human faces. It doesn't tell us about the cognitive process itself. If we look at an area of the brain which is highly activated when we're looking at faces, that doesn't tell us anything about how we process faces. It doesn't tell us whether we are fixating on single features and then binding them together or looking at the face as a holistic whole. It doesn't tell us anything about the algorithmic level. And it doesn't really tell us about how the brain supports that cognitive process. There's some kind of connection between the algorithm and the implementation that we can't just get by looking at the brain activity by itself. It requires a lot more modeling and a lot more hypothesis testing. So I just want us to be really careful and be really clear about what this tool is good for and what its limitations are. Okay, here it is. This is what we've all been waiting for, right? Functional specialization. This is what fMRI research is really all about. Why do we do fMRI research? Because we want to know if some part of the brain is specialized for a certain kind of cognitive function. What part of the brain does what? When we do something like see a human face, where is that happening in our brains? Well, what we're going to see is that while we do have some degree of specialization, right, there are some brain areas that do seem to perform specific tasks, like language is sort of lateralized in our left hemisphere. We have a language circuit. But it's not really that simple. That's kind of an oversimplification. It's a little bit messier. Functional specialization implies a certain kind of domain specificity. Domain specific cognition refers to this idea that maybe there are certain brain regions that only do very specific kinds of tasks. They only do computations over very specific kinds of inputs. Maybe we have some brain regions that are very dedicated to doing arithmetic or to processing music or to processing language or spatial navigation. That would be a kind of domain specific cognition because we're doing cognition over a very specific kind of input. But we know that there are also parts of the brain that are domain general. We have a central executive system that's very good at problem solving that allocates mental resources. That's very domain general. It's very flexible. It's not tied to one specific kind of input or one specific kind of computation. So this is part of the question that we're going to ask when we talk about fMRI, when we talk about brain function. We want to know whether certain kinds of computations are executed in a domain-specific way. Or they, is there an associated brain region that just handles that type of input, that type of computation? Or are they handled in a more domain-general way? Maybe there isn't a specific brain region. Maybe it's something that happens kind of globally. Or maybe there is a brain region that can do this but can do other things as well. So those are the kinds of questions that we want to ask. What degree of specialization do we find? And where do we find it? One of the most influential findings in this literature has been the discovery of the fusiform face area, the FFA. It's a very small area in sort of the back of our brains that's, that seems to be highly dedicated to perceiving and recognizing human faces. Now the way that we know this is research that was done mostly by Nancy Canwisher in which she would have participants look at images of different kinds of things and see where the brain activity was. And having done quite a lot of this, she discovered that there was an area that seemed to activate much more for faces than for anything else. But I think it's important to note that the fusiform face area doesn't only activate to faces. It activates to pretty much everything. So if you show someone a word, you'll get a small amount of activation in your FFA. If you show someone some scrambled text that doesn't really look like anything, you'll get a little bit of activation in the FFA. If you show a picture of an object like a bed or a house, you'll get a little bit of activation in FFA. If you show a picture of a face, you get a lot more activation. But it's not like that's the only thing that it's reacting to. It reacts to everything. There is something analogous. There is also a visual word form area, a very small part of our brains, also in the back in our occipital lobe, where we process visual words. When you see words written down, they are processed in a very specific part of our occipital lobe. 
But again, it doesn't activate only when we see words. It just activates the most when we see words. So you get activation in your visual word form area when you see words, but you will get a small amount of activation when you see scrambled up words that don't really look like anything, or pictures of objects, or pictures of faces. So there's not a nice clean division where we see activity in one place only for a very specific kind of input and we don't see it anywhere else. It's a little bit messy. We see a lot of activation in one area for a specific kind of input, but we see it in other areas as well. And for that area, we'll see a lot of activation for its specific kind of input, but we'll also see a little bit of activation for other things. So the visual word form area activates very strongly for visual words, but it also activates a little bit for faces. The fuse form face area activates very strongly for faces, but it will also activate for other things like visual words. We can also see things like theory of mind localized to very specific regions of the brain. Now, if you're not familiar, theory of mind is our ability to put ourselves into another person's shoes and model what we think is going on inside their heads. It's our ability to think about what another person might be thinking. So in an experiment where participants would read a story that either involved some kind of belief or maybe just something physical, what was found is that the right temporal parietal junction was highly activated when they were reading a story that involved beliefs, but not if the story didn't involve beliefs, even if the story was about people. So a story like Anne made some lasagna in the blue dish. After Anne left, Ian came home. He threw out the lasagna and made spaghetti in the blue dish and replaced it back in the fridge. Anne thinks the blue dish contains and then you fill in the blank. And in order for you to answer this question about what do you think Anne thinks is in the blue dish, you have to activate your theory of mind. You have to think about what it is that Anne knows and what she's thinking. And it turns out that when you do that, that processing highly activates your right temporal parietal junction in a way that your right temporal parietal junction is not activated when you read any other kind of story, even if it involves human agents, even if it involves people. If it doesn't involve the very specific process of you putting your own mind into the perspective of another person. So that's another kind of functional specialization. We can see this brain region. It seems to be specialized for thinking about what other people are thinking. And that's really interesting because that's another thing that maybe makes us human. So remember I mentioned a visual word form area. We have an area in our brains, in our occipital lobe, that's dedicated to processing visual words. Does that seem a little funny to you? Why do we have a specific brain region dedicated for processing visual words? Maybe that doesn't sound that weird because we do read a lot of words, so why not have a special part of our brains that's just for reading words? But this does get a little weird if we think about it in an evolutionary context. Anatomically modern human beings emerged maybe 100,000 years ago at the latest. Writing was only invented maybe 3,000 years ago at the earliest. That is a really recent development in terms of our evolutionary history. Writing has been around for a vanishingly short amount of time in terms of evolution. So it can't be the case that we have a naturally evolved visual word form area. It cannot possibly be the case that the visual word form area evolved to be specialized for reading visual words. Written words haven't existed long enough for that evolution to have taken place. That doesn't make any sense. So there's something really interesting happening here. What does that tell us about what the visual word form area is? It couldn't possibly have evolved specifically for this purpose. Instead, it must be something that our brains are co-opting, something that used to do something else, but that we can transition into doing something new. Writing is a pretty recent thing. Our brains had to have some kind of flexibility in terms of assigning that new kind of processing to some kind of brain area. And of course, this is something that's still ongoing. As we invent new things, we invent new technologies, we have new ways of interacting with the world, our brains have to respond to that in a flexible way.
And part of that flexibility is the ability to create new kinds of functional specializations. This ties into the concept of brain plasticity. How fixed is the relationship between our cognitive processes and our brain structures? Well, there are some really interesting case studies in plasticity. I think one of the most interesting is what happens in the brains of the blind. Remember that we have an entire visual cortex that's dedicated to processing visual information. Well, if you're blind from birth, that's a lot of wasted real estate in a certain sense. That's a lot of brain region dedicated to something, to a sensory modality that your body doesn't even have. And it turns out that what happens in these cases for people who are born blind, the visual cortex actually gets reassigned new functions. And for a lot of people who are born blind, the occipital lobe winds up doing a lot of language processing. So if we compare the brains of sighted and blind people who are, say, reading sentences, what we'll see is activation in the occipital lobe for the blind that we don't see for those who have sight. This is a really interesting demonstration of the fact that our brains are highly flexible. They are very plastic. They can change. And not just over evolutionary timescales and not just over cultural timescales, they can change over our own lifetimes. They are adaptable. If there's a brain region that was set aside for a specific purpose that we are not using for that purpose, it can be co-opted into doing something else. It can be given a new function. And there are even more extreme examples of this. There are cases of individuals who are missing entire brain hemispheres. And their brain, the remaining hemisphere, just maps all of those former functions to whatever brain regions they have left remaining. There are people who only have a single brain hemisphere and have no dysfunction whatsoever. They lead totally normal lives. This is kind of mind-blowing. They're missing half of the structure of a human brain with no ill effects whatsoever. Why? Because of brain plasticity, because of our brain's ability to rewire itself and assign new functions to old areas. Okay, here are our key concepts for this lecture. We talked about fMRI in quite a lot of detail. fMRI being the most prevalent type of hemodynamic measure for looking at brain activity. fMRI measures the bold signal, the blood oxygenation level dependent signal. It's a way of measuring blood flow. Essentially, it's a way of measuring the energy that is sent to the brain after some neurons fire. And we talked about the idea of neural correlates, that fMRI is fundamentally correlative. We are correlating cognitive processes with brain activity. We talked about functional specialization, the idea that there are specific brain regions that may have very special functions. And we talked about this in the context of domain general versus domain specific cognition. So when we have a certain brain region that's performing very specific computations or is only processing certain kinds of inputs, we say it's doing domain specific cognition cognition. But we have other brain regions that may be doing something more general. They're doing domain general cognition. They can operate over many kinds of input. And they can do many kinds of processes. And we talked about brain plasticity, the idea that our brains can change over time. Of course, they can change on an evolutionary time scale, but they can also change much more quickly. They can change over our own lifetimes. And we can co-opt areas that maybe were specialized for a certain function in the past, if we are no longer using them for that function, we can adapt them and specialize for a new function. We can rewire our own brains. So fMRI is a really great tool for telling us a lot about how our brain is structured and how that structure gives rise to the cognitive processes that we take for granted. It can tell us a lot about where things are happening in the brain. But fMRI has limitations. It's not so good at telling us what exactly those processes are. And I want to make the case in the next lecture that this is where electrophysiology really excels. So in the next lecture, we'll talk more about brain imaging, but we're going to talk specifically about electrophysiology, about EEG, and what EEG can tell us, the kinds of questions that EEG can answer. And they are very different kinds of questions than the questions we can answer with fMRI.